So I'd like to invite our next panel to come up, uh, which includes Rani Bagai, um, the granddaughter of Vaishnavas and Gala Bagai, um, Michelle, and Dr. Krithika Agarwal. And um, I think one of the important stories that we wanted to make sure to talk about today is that there were relatively few South Asian women in the country in, in the early period of immigration. And so Kalo Bagai was one of the first women in the country, and so this panel is going to talk about her story. I thought we would start, um, Sada has been collaborating with a group called Timeline to make short videos about South Asian American history. And so I wanted to play for you just a short video that we made about Kalo Bagai and her story. It's about three minutes long, that just very concisely gives her story, and then I think I'll turn it over to the panel.
Jadi bilang buat lagi. Sure. Um, so I'm going to tell uh, Kala's story in a little bit more detail and probably provide a little bit more historical context. Um, so the story of early South Asian immigrants to North America is primarily told through the stories of men. And it, it is true that indeed many of the early immigrants who came from South Asia to North America were men, as we've heard um, throughout the day. Many were laborers. They were fleeing poor economic and agricultural conditions in the Punjab region. A few were merchants, some were peddlers, some were students, and some were nationalists uh, who were fighting against the British. And many of these men ended up you know, working up and down the West Coast, in the fields of California, the, lumbers, the lumber mills of Oregon, in Washington, and the canneries in the Pacific Northwest Coast. Few women made the journey to come to North America, um, but there were a few. I mean, the, number, the total number of South Asians coming to the U.S. in the early 20th century were small. Uh, they never really exceeded more than a few hundred per year. But if you look at the reports of the Commissioner General of Immigration from the early 20th century, you do see like a handful of women coming in each year, like four or five. I've seen as many as a dozen admitted to the U.S. one year. So the number of women were small. And Erica Lee writes in The Making of Asian America, Traditional gender roles discouraged women from leaving home. There was the expense of immigration. There was discrimination in the United States and Canada. And immigration policies really made it very difficult for women and children to come to the United States. And this made the South Asian immigrant population in, the, in North America at the time mostly male. And most men, as we've seen, they were either single or they had families that they left behind in India. And single men, they did forge connections with women here, and um, Jyoti was talking about the Punjabi Mexican uh, communities that were forged in Southern California. Many uh, South Asian men married white women, or they formed communal relationships and attachments with each other. So, but South Asian women, they did come to the U.S., again, in very, very small numbers. Um, we know that some women came to attend college in the late 19th century. We know about Dr. Anandibai Joshi, who graduated from Women's Medical College in Pennsylvania in the class of 1886, and so that his materials related to her story and some other South Asian women who were part of a cohort. But many of these women left the U.S. Um, they they went back to India after they graduated. But given the sort of small number of early South Asian women immigrants, it's no surprise that there's very little research done in their lives. And this is why Kala Baga is so interesting, because we know so much about her. <laughs> and the reason we know so much about her is because of Rani and her family and what her descendants, the documents and the oral histories that they've left behind. So Kala was born in Punjab, in Amritsar. She was only 12 years old, as you saw, when she was married to Vaishna Das, who was about six months older than her. She'd in fact been engaged to Vaishna when she was only two or three years old, according to her oral history, Vaishnav's aunt, who was living in Amritsar at the time, uh, apparently Kala caught her eye, and <laughs> she decided that this was ours, like this daughter was ours. <laughs> and apparently Kala was only a nine-month-old baby at the time. <laughs> and two, when Kala was two or three years old, they did the sadam ceremony, and they were engaged. Um, so for the next few years after she got married, um, Kala shuttled between Banaras, uh, where her father had moved for business, and Peshawar, which is where Vaishnav Das's family lived. And she became pregnant at the age of 15, and she stayed in Banaras for a year and gave birth to her oldest son, Bridge. She eventually had two more sons, Madan and Ram. And at the time, Vaishnav was going to school, and he slowly was becoming interested in the anti-British cause. According to Kala, Vaishnav met with some Gadris in Peshawar and became interested in the Gadar movement in the U.S. And Vaishnav apparently met with a Gadri who encouraged him to come to the U.S. and he encouraged him to leave his wife and his children behind in India. But Vaishnav didn't think that was a good idea. He believed that if he left his wife in India, then he may not like her anymore because he will come to America and he, he will meet different women. And, you know, so he decided to take his wife and children along with him to the U.S. And you know a lot of the story because there was an oral history interview done with Kala by her grandson. And in the interview, 
um, she recalled the rationale for why um, she, why her husband moved to the U.S. Um, she said, the Gadar movement wanted to take the British out of India. Mr. Bagai was in that movement. He said, I don't want to stay in the slave country. I want to go to America where there's no slavery. And their son Ram Bagai later wrote that the British Civil Intelligence Department had marked Mr. Bagai as a, poten as a potential revolutionary and they were harassing him in India, which sort of hastened their departure from India to the US. So in 1915, Colin Vesno arrived at the Port of San Francisco with their three children. Um, as a South Asian family, they were a pretty rare sight in the city, and as you saw, you know, their arrival was covered in the local newspapers. When they arrived, they arrived on a Saturday, and they weren't allowed to land immediately because the immigration offices were closed. So on the boat, they separated Kala and her two younger sons from Vesno and the oldest son. So you can sort of imagine what this must be like for Kala. She didn't speak any English at the time, you know, and now she comes to this foreign country after having made this long journey, and she's separated from her husband. And again, she recalled in her interview, when the eating time came, they said, chow, chow, chow. So I understood that means to eat. So I went over there. She didn't like the food. Um, but she says, I saw that they were selling some fruits, so I bought some fruits but I did not know how much money to give. So I took the money and put it in my hand and let him take whatever he wants. So considering that they were kind of an oddity at Angel Island at the time, as you saw the San Francisco call post called her the first Hindu woman to enter San Francisco in a decade. You have to kind of take that with a grain of salt. I don't know if that's actually true. Um, they also credited her with introducing the city to the latest thing in jewelry, the nose diamond. <laughs> and ran a picture of her holding his son, Ram Mohan. Um, the Bagais were interrogated at Angel Island. Uh, immigrants coming into the United States at the time had to prove that they were not likely to become a public charge. Basically, what that means is that they were not going to end up as a burden on the government and the welfare system. Um, but the Bagai family, as uh, you know, they apparently, according to the newspapers at the time, had about $25,000 in gold and cash. Um, Kala did not confirm this in her interview. Um, she did say, though, that Vaishno's father was a wealthy man in India, and they had gotten the money by selling his share of the property. So once in California, the guys moved into a furnished place, and they were gradually able to rent an apartment. Kala was 21 years old at, the, old at the time that she came, and she was not able to speak English, and she found her life, quote-unquote, strange. She found it strange, for example, that people didn't take a bath here every day. <laughs> she found it a challenge to provide childcare for her three children without assistance from her family or without assistance from domestic help. Um, and I, I found this really interesting that they actually placed their three children with German families who helped care for them. Um, Kala herself lived with an American family for a few months trying to learn English, but she left because she didn't want to be away from her husband and her children. Um, so they were relatively wealthy, but this did not shield them from racism and from discrimination. Um, when they, after they came, they purchased a home in Berkeley, but on moving day, as you saw in the video, they discovered that they had been locked out from the house, so the neighbors had locked the house and preventing them from moving in. And this is again from Kala's interview. She said, all of our luggage and everything was loaded on the trucks. I told Mr. Bagai, I don't want to live in this neighborhood. I don't want to live in this house because they might hurt my children and I don't want it. So he agreed, we paid for the house and they locked the doors? No. So the family then moved to San Francisco on Fillmore Street, where Vashner ran a general store and an import export business. Um, you know, after he came to the U.S., he, he, he adapted to American life quite well. He wore American suits, Vaishno, he spoke English fluently, he adopted Western manners. Um, I think his store was called Bagai's Bazaar. Yes. <laughs> um, his experience in the Gadar party, though, were not exactly what he'd hoped for. Um, at some point, he became involved in internal politics of the party and was accused by Pandit Ram Chandra, the very man that he had come to the U.S. to work for, for being a British spy. And this had, Bagai considered himself really patriotic, and this was, he was very hurt by these insinuations. Um, in 1921, he applied to the federal court in San Francisco and became a naturalized U.S. citizen. 
But as many of you know, in 1923, there was a famous Supreme Court case of Bhagat Singh Ken versus United States, where the Supreme Court determined that South Asians could not, were not eligible for US citizenship because they were not white, because naturalization laws at the time limited naturalization to free white men and people of African descent. So Pind had gone to the courts arguing that he should be allowed to keep his citizenship because he was Aryan, therefore he was white. And the court essentially said, maybe that's true from a scientific perspective, it's not true from scientific, but at the time, <laughs> the racial classification at the time, scientific racial classification at the time classified Aryans to be white. So, but the Supreme Court was like, yeah, maybe science says so, but we can see you're not white, you know. This is not the common understanding of what white means. So they took Tin's citizenship away from him. And after that, the US Justice Department denaturalized every other South Asian person in the United States at the time who had managed to naturalize. And this was about 69 people who were denaturalized, and Vaishnav was one of them. And the effects of losing his citizenship were quite traumatic for Vaishnav. Um, South Asians were not allowed to own land at the time because of alien land laws in California, which prevented non-US citizens from owning property. So he was forced to liquidate some of his property. Um, and then, as you saw, he was denied a US passport to visit India. And the US government essentially recommended that you should apply for a British passport and resume your British citizenship. So he was pretty dis 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 disillusioned by you know a lot of these things that were happening. And, and he rented a room in San Jose and committed suicide by poisoning himself with gas in 1928. And I wanted to read the letter that he left behind in a little bit more detail. Um, he wrote, I came to America thinking, dreaming, and hoping to make this land my home, sold my properties, and brought more than $25,000 to this country, established myself, and tried to give my children the best American education. But now they come to me and say I'm no longer an American citizen. They will not permit me to buy my home, and lo, they even shall not issue me a passport to go back to India. Now what am I? What have I made of myself and my children? We cannot exercise our rights. Humility and insults. Who is responsible for all this? Myself and the American government. I do not choose to live the life of an intern person. Yes, I'm in a free country and can move about where and when I wish inside the country. Is life worth living in a gilded cage? Obstacles this way, blockades that way, and the bridges burn behind. So after, after, after his death, Kala recalled being quite lonesome and lost, but she eventually managed to stand on her own two feet. Um, Vaishno had taken out multiple life insurance policies and left detailed instructions on how to you know, access the money that he had left behind for her. And using that, Kala was able to send all three of her children to college. Um, she learned English, and a few years after his death, in 1934, she married Mahesh Chandra who was a close family friend and also a member of the Gadar party. It's quite interesting that Mahesh actually came to the US in 1910 with five of his siblings, um, including two sisters. So that's another example of South Asian women coming to the US. One sister, Kanta Chandra, she remained in San Francisco, and another went back to India after graduating from Berkeley. And the newspapers ran a short story of her going back to India. Um, Tragedy, however, struck Kala again when one of her sons, Madan, who couldn't find a job in the United States, um, returned to India and died from an illness. So after the Loose Seller Act was passed in 1946, Kala and her two remaining sons were able to apply for naturalization and they became US citizens. So I think I'll, I'll sort of end there. She was you know, one of the first South Asian women to come to the US in the early 20th century and her legacy just kind of lives on in her children and the community that she formed. Yeah. And I think now we'll hear from Ronnie Bagai, who's Kala's granddaughter. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Yes, it's a very large Indian American community today that um, is here due to a uh, large degree her efforts. So, a little over 20 years ago, a filmmaker. Jay Sweetheart, who happens to be here today, interviewed my father. She was doing a PBS documentary called Roots in the Sand, and her documentary was one of the very first to highlight the role of Indian immigrants to the US in the early 1900s. 
And Jaisu was interested in the story of nearly 5,000 Punjabi men who immigrated to California just after the turn of the century. And they settled in the Imperial Valley where they irrigated the desert using water from the Colorado River, similar to how they had farmed in the Punjab. But since these men could not bring their wives and families from India, they settled down and married local women who worked the farms. These were Mexican-born women whose culture was very similar to Punjabi culture. And so J. Sri documented how an entire Punjabi Mexican community was born in the Central Valley. So J. Sri was interested in this unique group and their struggle for economic and political survival because of how much discrimination they faced. And she interviewed my father because she was very interested in how he came to San Francisco with his family because they were one of the very first families that were admitted by immigration through Angel Island. And you saw the lovely uh, article, uh, which you can also see on Saba's website, of my grandmother with her nose diamond holding her baby, who is my father. Uh, and it says she's the first Hindu woman uh, in 10 years, or to enter the city in 10 years. So let me talk about her a little more, and then I'll talk about my materials. I can only imagine what a challenge this journey was for Kala. She had little schooling, grew up in uh, Amritsar, Varanasi, had never seen an ocean before. And in uh, her husband Vaishno's household, there were servants and relatives to look after their children. And so Kala was not expected to cook or shop or raise children on her own. Now she crossed the Pacific with her husband and three small boys. And she's in America now. And um, her challenge is how to figure out life in a new country, how to raise three children on her own where she can't read or speak the language, doesn't know the food or customs. And by the way, she's vegetarian. Oh. But you know, I can imagine her gazing at San Francisco as their steamship approached in 1915, seeing this gleaming city newly rebuilt from the 1908 earthquake, right? Astonishing. And what's there, she and my grandfather Vaishno tour the World's Fair. It was the Panama Pacific Exposition. It had things like the Liberty Bell on display. It was on tour across the United States and the first transcontinental telephone line to New York City. So Kala saw all these things, and though I'm sure she felt galaxies away from the world she left in India and very homesick, I know that she also took delight in what an amazing place she found her new home to be. And she told Vaishno she yearned to go to school and travel and see more of the world. And Vaishno, to his credit, I think was a fairly enlightened man for his time, not just because of the you know, progressive ideals he had that brought him to America, wanting to live as a free man where he could start a business, work for India's independence without fear of arrest, raise his children in a free and open society. But he wanted Kala to enjoy these benefits as a woman too. So he did something well-intentioned, but rather unconventional. He decided she could best learn English and American customs and household skills if she was less burdened by child rearing. So they boarded my father, Ram, with another family until he was a little bigger. And Vishnu <coughs> even had Kala live with another family for a time so she could focus on learning English. But ultimately, she didn't care for this arrangement. And as she said, I'm living in one place, my husband's in another, and my children yet, you know, in other people's homes. So after a year or so, she decided she'd had enough and could manage her family, and they all moved back in together. And as you know, there weren't many other South Asians in the San Francisco area at this time. There was a family named Chandra they became good friends with, and a few others. But other immigrants occasionally trickled in, and Vaishno was very social and gregarious, and so Kala never to, learned never to be surprised when he would bring home two or three guests for dinner. And she also uh, was very social, loved making new friends. And being able to provide a welcome to 
fellow immigrants, even if nothing more than a home-cooked meal, which I'm sure they were very grateful for and I'm sure they badly missed that kind of thing. So, uh, in 1921, as you heard, uh, Vaishnav was granted naturalization. And then, as you may know, things took a bad turn. In 1923, the Supreme Court ruled in the thin decision that Indians could not be considered white for the purpose of citizenship. And due to that, the INS rescinded American citizenship of all currently naturalized Indians. So Vaishno became, in a word, stateless. He was asked to return his naturalization certificate and was denied an American passport to travel to India, but having been an activist all of his life, he refused to ever become a British subject again. So 1928, he took his own life. And the San Francisco Examiner published his suicide letter that explains in anguish detail exactly why he chose this ultimate method of protest. As you can imagine, the Bagai family was devastated, but Kala did. Uh, you know, managed to stay resilient and because of Vaishno's advanced planning for this, this act. She was able to put her three boys, including my, my dad, through college. But instead of returning to her family in India, as one might expect a, wid a widow to do, she went about the process of reinventing herself. She finally went to night school. She even learned to play tennis. Uh, she did visit her family in India uh, later to um, get her, two of her sons married, but she never went back to live. California was her home now. And then finally, she did the ultimate unconventional thing for an Indian widow. She remarried. <laughs> she married to, uh, to their Indian friend, <laughs> Mahesh Chandra, and she could now satisfy her desire to travel more of the world. So, they went to, uh, she and Mahesh went to London and Tokyo and the Eiffel Tower and the Egyptian pyramids. And I know this because they left behind photo albums consisting mostly of selfies <laughs> at all these landmarks. Uh, in the 40s, Mahesh and Kala moved to Los Angeles and they got their citizenship as soon as they were able to do so. And as the stream of South Asian immigrants picked up uh, slowly in the 50s and 60s, they continued welcoming visitors to their home. And Kala was at the heart of the Indian American community in Los Angeles and very active in community functions and events. Now, let me just say a few words about Mahesh Chandra, my step-grandfather, because maybe half my collection comes from him. Uh, so Mahesh graduated from UC Berkeley. He came with his five siblings. Uh, and he and his uh, brothers were very active in the Gutter Party. And so the two families, the guys and Chandra's, were close friends. But Mahesh collected many, many related, uh, Gutter-related publications. Uh, lots of clippings, lots of newspapers uh, published in California uh, and Oregon and Washington and Canada uh, by other Indian American activists, including even some written by his own brother. So when Mahesh died, it was discovered he left behind a mass of political slash nationalist literature in several suitcases. So let's talk a little more about the materials. Uh, Jay Sri stayed in touch with my dad up until he died in 2000. And uh, he told her many times, as well as others, about, you know, kind of complaining about having so much material, feeling it had too much significance to throw away, but no real idea as to what to do with it. You see, plus, in addition to his parents' papers and Mahesh's collection of activist material, my mother and father had their own stuff. <laughs> my father belonged to the Hollywood Foreign Press and was even president of it back in the 50s, uh, the Golden Globes. He was one of the first to distribute Indian films in the US, so he had many actual films, as well as all the files relating to them. He uh, revered uh, Gandhi, and he gave lectures on Gandhi. 
So he had a collection of film, uh, literature, archives on Gandhi, as well as Nehru. My mother reviewed books by Indian authors for the LA Times, and she even wrote her own book, actually, about the contributions of South Asians in America. So she had a library of books about India, and her own files on Indian art and culture. And since they were both active, along with Kala, in the Indian American community, they kept anything to do with that. So if anyone here remembers the 20th century concept of a clipping service, that's what my parents were. They collected anything published about uh, India or Indians in America. So when my father died, it fell to me to clean out his apartment and finally go through all the material he had saved. I realized I had a great responsibility to do this right. And I had a good deal of sentimentality about this um, material because, of course, so much was personal to my family. But as I went through it over time, I developed other um, insights into it. You see, I realized this collection isn't just about my family's personal stories and struggles to achieve a foothold here. And I'd understand if you thought that was really the crux of these papers. But as I came to realize, the rest of this collection, the published material collected by my parents and Mahesh, is a parallel narrative about America's awareness of India and how America told itself their stories. We're gazing at India's reflection in America's mirror. Take the article on Kala, the fact that, you know, she's the first Indian woman, blah, blah, blah. All the, re all the reporter really wants to talk about is the nose diamond. <laughs> so there's my grandmother and her personal story she left behind, and then there's the story about her through America's lens. So the point I'm making is much of this collection reflects America's narrative on Indians in America, how America saw their exotic food and dress, but also they're suffering under British rule and why the gutter party uh, was demanding self-rule for India. How one Indian named Bagai protested his denaturalization by taking his own life. Reviews of the first Indian movie shown in New York by my dad. Photos showing Mayor Yorty greeting Nehru when he visited LA and grand receptions held at LA hotels for diplomats and congressmen uh, from India. How the first South Asian congressman, Mr. Sand, was elected. And America's narrative of the idea of civil dis disobedience, initially through newsreel footage of Nehru and Gandhi's marches and speeches, but later linking back America's Martin Luther King back to Gandhi and how America, in gradual steps, not only reversed itself and decided Indians could once again immigrate and, and, and become citizens, but also articles showing America now at getting interested in Ravi Shankar, Bollywood films, spiritual teachers, classical dancing and yoga, and how we Americans can learn to make curries and how we Americans can learn to drape a sari correctly. You see, this collection, represents the story. It's actually, it's not just the story. As interesting as it may be of how the first Indian families assimilated into America, it is just as much the story of America slowly assimilating Indian culture and themes into its own fabric. So I look at all this stuff and I say, wow, this is really interesting, wonderful, amazing stuff. And I do what any normal person would do. I stuff it into boxes. I take it home. I put it in my storage room and I say, I'll think about it next year. <laughs> <laughs> then in 2008, Jay Sri let, lets me know that two women, uh, historians, want to talk to me because they're interested in collaborating on a book about the history of Angel Island with a chapter on each immigrant group, why they came, um, including uh, a, a one chapter on immigrants from India, and so they cover my grandparents' story in great detail. 
And it was these two historians, uh, Erica Lee and Judy Young, who later put me in touch with Samit and Michelle. And it was very timely because like them, uh, like my dad, I'm getting very discouraged about what to do with the collection. It's one thing to use it to help writers and historians and filmmakers create their stories, but I can't do this forever. And being in my house, how on earth can others know about it, discover what's in it, and use it? Uh, as I told Michelle, the first day I, I met her was that God knows I want this material accessible. It does no one any good in boxes or only I know to where to find things. I want anyone, not just academics, to be able to um, search it so they can share it, learn from it, perhaps inspire uh, others to dig up their own family histories and add them. Meanwhile, you'll be glad to know, over the years since I took the boxes home with me, I did slowly sort them out, gradually eating the elephant a bite at a time. I organized, cataloged, and made sense of the material. And this really had to be done because it has little value to me or anyone else unless it's organized. It does no good to upload all this stuff to SADA if we don't know who are the people in the photos, what event is being commemorated, what story this letter relates to, I am the only one who could bring sense to it. So it's a lonely task, it's slow going, it's difficult to stay detached and you know treat it as a simple data organization progress. I want to stop and read every page of every family letter. Uh, I want to read every article, I want to Google every name and organization, and I can't throw anything away because I might not find the Indian Home Rule Association of America Constitution and Bylaws and 1916 member directory very interesting, but I sense it's going to make some future PhD candidate in Asian American studies wet themselves when they see it. <laughs> so I want to thank Sada, Sam, Samik, and Michelle, and J3 too, for reaching out to me, letting me share my family stories letting me share this collection that describes not just my family and other South Asian stories, but it's America's narrative of the process of absorbing these pioneers. And I hope that story now continues with you. Ronnie is such a hard act to follow. That was amazing. It's been such a privilege and honor working on this collection and um, supervising many of my students who were helping with the digitization project, in particular Emily McNish, who also conducted a very well done oral history with Ronnie that's on the SADA website. And um, some of my students, as they were doing the digitization work, you know, digitization, it can be unglamorous, but the students loved working on this collection and they would constantly flag things for me and say, check this out, you know, this is the coolest record ever. Um, I don't have that much to add to these two amazing panelists, um, but I did want to point out that one of the amazing things about this collection is that you actually get to hear Kala's voice because of this oral history interview that was done in 1982. And I want to play just a minute or two of it so that we can hear her voice in the room. In the living room with Chaiji, she's our grandmother. We love her very much. Today is the 26th of November. 1982. This is my cousin so talking. We're going to be just asking Jaisa some questions, and she's going to share with you some of the experiences that she came over to this country so long ago. Go ahead, Jaisa. No, well, that's the guy, Sandra. And when I came to this country, I was about 21 years of age. I had two children, big one, nothing one, and round one. And uh, I couldn't speak English. I didn't know one word of English at the time. And uh, Everything was strange to me in this country. Anyhow, uh, I was used to taking a bath every day and so forth. 
But uh, in those days there, in America, it's a day and night different now than it was when we came. So people didn't take a bath as they go there that time. And uh, so if you want to take a bath, they lock up the door and then you've got a key to open it. Of course, when we came, we went to the permit room, you know. Anyhow, uh, so I had three children with me. My youngest <coughs> boy was unknown. He was but a little over a year old. And mother was about four, four and a half. And Ram was uh, about seven. What year was that, John? Yeah, 19. We are so lucky, all of us in this room, that Ronnie's family had the foresight to do this oral history and that Ronnie also had the foresight of preserving it. Um, it's really just remarkable. I encourage all of you to go on the site and listen to the whole thing. It's over an hour long. Um, for me, finding this collection or you know, getting in touch with Ronnie and seeing these materials, it was a huge lesson in always looking out for the voices that are marginalized or hidden, even within the records of an already marginalized community. Right, so questions like, where are the women? Where are the working classes? Where are lower castes? Where are LGBTQ community stories? Um, I think these are questions that we have to constantly have to ask ourselves as we're doing archival work. And it's simply not enough to say there aren't any records documenting that. Often there are. You just really have to look hard to find them. Um, and listen very closely and carefully when you do. And so I'm so grateful for Ronnie and for Mrs. Bagai um, for teaching me that important lesson. Um, I'm also so grateful for Ronnie to connecting us to this history. So you often hear of historians saying they discovered something in archives and nothing annoys archivists more than historians saying they discovered something that was already like, meticulously cataloged in an archive. Um, so many steps and much labor and care and expertise go into preserving collections and making them accessible to the public. So I've done some work thinking through what it would be like to build an ethics of care in archives. Um, archivists are trained to deal with the stuff. Um, but through my work with SADA, I've begun to realize that it's actually not about the stuff. The primary obligation is to people. And it's the stories that the, the stuff enables us to tell that are actually really important, right? Um, so in collecting materials, archivists enter into webs of relationships with the creators of materials, the subjects of materials, the donors of materials, the users, and the larger community who is implicated in them in the present and in the future, including all of us in this room right now today. Um, so I argue that we have to take these relationships really seriously and to position ourselves as archivists as having radical empathy with these creators and subjects and donors and users and communities. Um, in helping to steward these collections in SADA, I think I've entered into this ongoing relationship of care, um, which is infused in all, everything Samit does, right? It's this deep relationship of care um, with, with everyone in the South Asian American community, but in this particular case, with Kala and Ronnie and your family and all of us in this room. And that relationship doesn't end after the records are scanned or the metadata is created and the record is made accessible. It's, it's ongoing. And I think with Sana, we really try to take that very seriously. Time for questions, yeah? Yeah, are there any questions? I just want to say, Ronnie, thank you so much for speaking today. Um, I'm a mixed race person, my dad's from Punjab. So to hear someone who looks like me claim this history is so important to me because phenotype really does rule who gets to tell certain stories. And you just gave me permission to talk about my grandmother. I have to thank you for that. You really authenticated my experience by being here. Thank you. I am so pleased to hear that. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Please. Other people may be interested. When I talked to your father about the reels of the films, yes. he suggested to me that they were negatives as well as prints. There were some negatives. Yeah. And Do you know where they are? And <laughs> I, I have them. In fact, I have just gone through. I've just gone through the process of digitizing them. Oh, mm -hmm. good. Yes. 
Um, there are a number of um, small, uh, like art films, dancing, uh, music and dancing films, um, 10 to 15 minutes long, and then there were several feature films. Um, if any of you yeah, recall any of Shantaram's films, um, my father tried to bring several of those feature films to India, one of them being Two Wise, Twelve Hands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have those films and I just completed actually the process, long process of getting them digitized and uh, cleaned up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, also in India, many of those negatives have been Yes, by the National Archive. Um, they have uh, unfortunately allowed many of them to deteriorate to the point where they were lost. Now, mine had been sitting around in a basement, well, either my brother's basement or my basement for also many years, but at least they were, you know, somewhat temperature controlled. Um, and they, they did survive and it, well enough to be, and now they're transferred, so they are safe. Well, I just mention it in case other people are interested, but we can talk about this later. Yeah. In the archives world, that's called LOCKS, which stands for Lots of Copies Keep Stuff Safe. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So on a lighter note, uh, I feel like sometimes it's a bug that you know we all have or we don't have when we want to research our family history and we get attached to it and want to dig into it further. Uh, being that person or being the family that you do have that bug, how does the family support that? Um, initiative that you take? Well, it kind of fell to me. <laughs> they supported, in other words, uh, you know, someone else taking it the, you know, besides them. <laughs> it was like they, they actually did support it as a you know, very uh, commendable idea and someone needs to do this and Ronnie, you are the one to do it. Uh, so they, they knew that I would, you know, care for the materials and uh, look after them uh, and I I have done so again you know I felt it was my responsibility um, but I accepted that very happily and willingly because I said no one else is gonna do this like I'm you know going to and um, you know when you you care about it you you know you should be the one to to do that to carry that out uh, so um, yes but you know uh, I still have the paper uh, material and so uh, shortly I am I am hoping to find a home just just for the paper but it you know it's a immense relief and load off my back to know that they are saved and that you know um, SADA has them and that you know this way anyone can find them anyone can search through them uh, they don't have to go into some you know library and search through some dusty boxes to see what's there it's, it's out there to be found. And I'm so glad. Thank you all so much.